Sir Lang, President of the Institute, and the distinguished uh, invitees, my dear friends. First of all, let me say it's a pleasure to be here at an event organized by the Chartered Accountants, which, as I mentioned, is, uh, is my own profession. So I'm delighted to be here to share a few thoughts this morning. When he invited me, I told him that uh, it's a topic that everyone knows because we get so much of advice from so many people daily. Uh, I was wondering why anybody needs to discuss it as well. Then he said, you know, I think we need to hear from uh, within, then we get a deeper understanding into the subject. So I thought maybe, although the topic says what's ahead, we've got to think back a little bit as well. Where we were, how did we get here, and then what's the course that we are going to chart for the future. I think that's an important uh, way forward. And let me try and deal with this topic in that fashion. What are the normal dynamics of debt? Your CEOs, your chartered accountants, you know that in debt, we have to understand that every time we take debt, we have the ability to repay. That's the most important criteria. If you don't have that, then you get into serious trouble. So you got to understand whether it is within your overall income levels. That's why even if someone goes to the bank and says, I want a loan, the first question the bank asks, I can see Jonathan here, is what is your income? Quite naturally. Because if you don't have income, or if the income level doesn't support the debt that you are attempting to take, that debt won't be feasible. So, first question is, what's your income? And that's why we measure in a country debt to income, which is debt to GDP. Then the second is, in my view, the ability to repay is depends on debt serviceability. What is the interest rate? The higher the interest rate, the greater the burden that you put on your own profitability. And then that can be an issue if it is rising. Japan has a debt to GDP of nearly 250%, but their interest rate is less than 1%. So the debt servicing is much easier. But if you have a debt which is 14%, the interest rate, then to that extent, you have a major hit into your PNL. So naturally, you got to make sure that your interest rate is low. The composition, particularly when you have exchange fluctuations, how much foreign, how much local, what is your possibility of that depreciating, these are all factors that you will be looking at very seriously. Then your future income generation, that actually in a country is reflected in your growth prospects. If you are growing, then your country can take it. If you are not growing, then you get constrained. If it's a company, if your company hits the gold runs, you'll find that you are unable to pay your debt because your growth that you envisaged with the new asset that you are borrowed for, you won't be able to make the payments. So this is very simple. When you just translate what you have in companies into the country itself. Sri Lanka's debt history. I won't go too back in time. But 2005, we had a debt to GDP of 91%. People have forgotten that. But when we came into office in early 2006, I remember as a governor, the debt to GDP ratio was 91%. The rupee debt had also been uh, quite high. The forex debt in 1989, if you go back, was 62% of GDP. In 1995, it was 52%. 2004, it was as high as 48%. Then we knew that this is a challenge and that you've got to deal with it. So by 2014, if you look at the numbers, you would find that there was a constructive activity that attempted to bring that down. And by 2014, the foreign debt component was only 30% of GDP. 
Cred că se duce. Local debt component was 41%. So the total debt to GDP by 2014 was 71%. Interest rates were down. Those of you who can remember would have not, not known interest rates were down. The rupee was stable. In fact, in 2014 and 2013, the entire debt stock reduced by more than 115 billion rupees. 115 billion rupees, mind you, is the cost of the Hambantu report. Reduced around that much because of the appreciation of the currency. You can just see what an impact appreciation of a currency can have. So on the same tone, depreciation of the currency could have also have in the debt stock. So 2014, the foreign debt was 24 billion dollars. The local debt was 33 billion dollars. So the total debt we had was 57 billion dollars. The GDP was close to 80 billion dollars, 79 point something. Forex debt was 30 percent. And another important factor that we talk about today, the ISBs, the international sovereign bonds, was 5 billion in relation to a GDP which was 80 billion. Now this is the background. So 5 billion ISBs on a GDP of 80 billion was around 6.5%. Now that meant that ISBs were 5 billion, total foreign debt was 24 billion, all the others, the World Bank, ADB, China, Japan, Japan incidentally is the largest lender to Sri Lanka, all of them put together was 19 billion rupees. Sorry, 19 billion dollars. So that's an equation. Then came the next period, 2015 to 2019. There was a certain set of factors that occurred which changed this debt dynamic. I'll give you that also in a brief fashion. The economy that did grow from 24 billion to 80 billion grew only up to just 84 billion. So the five years, the growth was only a $4 billion growth as far as the country's situation was concerned. So the 7% growth that we had been able to sustain dropped to around 2 to 3%. So as a result, that was a major complication. The rupee that was stable was depreciated and from 131 to 181, there was a nearly 50 rupee depreciation, which also costed it about 1.7 trillion got added to the debt of the country as a result of the rupee depreciation. So that's another serious addition to your debt stock. Then came the FDI opportunities, which again were stagnant, which meant that we were once again rising debt situation and the debt to GDP rose to around 87% by the end of 2019. Now, that would have been also tough. But what was even worse was the fact that the forex debt rose from 24 billion to 35 billion. The forex debt as a total rose from 24 to 35. That's 11 billion actually. Whereas the economy grew by only four. So then what happened was the total forex debt as a percentage of GDP as far as the forex debt was concerned was nearly 50%, sorry, 41% of GDP. But worse than that was the fact that ISPs, the international sovereign bonds, increased from 5 billion to 15 million. So the additional amount that got added to the debt stock of Sri Lanka was essentially the foreign debt that came from ISPs. Some people don't give that enough attention. So what happened was the debt stock in ISPs, which is foreign debt stock, rose to 15 million. And that 
amounted to nearly 18% of the GDP. The rest of the debt that has come from China, Japan, ADB, and World Bank, which was earlier just 19 billion in 2014, went up to only 20 billion. So 1 billion more from the concessionary type of lenders, but 10 billion more from the others. So you can see the mismatch. Now I'm, not, I'm just saying this not to complain about it, but to say this is the status. So what has effectively happened was that the growth had stagnated, the forex debt grew from 24 to 25, out of the increase of 11 billion of dollars, 10 came from ISPs, 10 came from ISPs, and the last few ISPs were borrowed at 7.8% in dollars. And we also had nearly $7 billion being borrowed in a, in a 15 month period from April 2018 to June 2019. Now that's the platform. That's the platform that we had at a, in the January 2020. So we had to take some choices. What do we do? You are CEOs, you know, you have to deal with it. So then, what's, what is ahead? If you take that same route, you know where you end up. Can we borrow more from uh, ISPs? Do you want to increase it before you increase your GDP? Can you increase more? I don't think so. As a rational CEO, if you tell me, no, no, we will make the 15 billion, 20 billion. I don't think your shareholders are going to like it. So we have to take some choices. We have to take some calls. Do we borrow more? No. I think we should not borrow more. That was the call that the government took. We should not borrow more from foreign sources. We have to cap it. Maybe we might have a change within. We can have one being replaced by another. But as a total debt stock, until we increase the GDP from the 84 to at least 100 or 110 billion dollars, we got to be conscious of the debt servicing and then we had to deal with it. Then came the interest rate. Interest rates, as you know, were quite high. From around 4% to 4.5% that we had in 2014, it had risen to nearly 6.5% as a total percentage of GDP. Again, that had to be shrunk. If that didn't shrink, we would have had another additional problem. So we had to take steps to deal with that as well. Then, can we allow the rupee to depreciate further? What a hint it takes into your balance sheet, into the country's budget. We had to stabilize the rupee. Yes, I know it was a tough call. Not everything that we plan to do could be done with the advent of COVID. With some income streams drying up, it was a tough call. It still is a tough call, and we'll have to deal with it even more as we go along in the future. But yet, the attempt was clear. We had a policy direction that we had set out that we would want to ensure that the rupee was stable. We took that seriously. We, in fact, went to the extent of curtailing certain imports. In fact, sometimes people used to ask me, uh, how are you going to get growth? Yes, that is a challenge when you curtail certain imports. But what are the choices that you have? If you have one major income stream drying up, you have to change your lifestyle. You have to look at a new normal. If you are a businessman and you are having three or four different types of activities, when one stream dries up, what do you do? Do you say, no, no, we'll just go on the same way? No, I don't think so. You'll change. So that's the change that we took. And the priority that was given was to conserve the forex so that we can make the payments to our creditors so that Sri Lanka won't be defaulting on its loans. So it's a question of taking certain priorities. 
if we didn't take the import controls, we'd have not enough dollars to pay the loans. So that's the choice that we had to make. So we took the choice that we thought was this, we'd curtail certain imports and deal with it on those lines. We also had the choice. Can we tax the people more? In fact, many came and told us. I think Gavin also knows. Many people still tell us, why don't you increase the taxes? At this stage, where you are attempting to once again make growth happen, do you want to put another dam? Again, the choice. So we took the choice. No, we will allow people to grow their businesses so that we make the GDP higher. If you make the GDP higher, also you can make your equation better. That's another way of looking at it. So we are still keeping our faith that the private sector, the business, the SME sector will drive growth forward. And if growth is driven from forward, I think we can still have an equilibrium that would be acceptable to everyone. Do we tighten what policy? Again, the choice. Do you want us to increase interest rates? Can you do your businesses with that? If you increase interest rates? And then what will happen? If you get back into a further contracting stage, even with the COVID, we are seeing 5% growth occurring now. I think this quarter, we will have 5% growth. Next, next quarter too. The last quarter would have been a kind of aberration because of the previous year's second quarter being a 16% negative. I think we'll have a double digit growth for the second quarter this year. Of course, it's not something that has occurred because of additional growth, but because of the low base. But yet, 2021 would not be a year which will be a contracting year, a contraction year. It will be a growth year, which is good, which is what we, we must uh, encourage. But if we type what policy, governor can do that at any time. He can increase the interest rates if he wishes to. But he has to take a call overall. And I think the call that he has taken so far is that we have to encourage the growth to occur and growth will occur if you go on like that. So these are the choices. Then we also hear many people coming and saying, go to the IMF. It seems to be like the panacea for all ills. I know so many analysts who also come and say, go to the analysts, they will fix it for you. I know what it is to go to the IMF. In 2008, I created that effort together with the government. So we had all those discussions. And then we went to them with a plan. At that time, during the global crisis, there was a reduction in the total inflows. And we contracted at that time with IMF. We got a facility from them. And at that time, the intention was to grow the reserves to $3.5 billion. To grow the reserves to $3.5 billion. That was the benchmark. If you read the letter of intent, that is there in the website even today, you will find that that is the overall intention of that IMF program. But as a result of our activities, as well as the trust that we had, we had $8.2 billion that we were able to achieve by the end of 2014. But that was at that time. This time around, the request that, that is coming to us is to go to the IMF so that we can restructure loans. I don't think any, there is any reason for us to do that. If we have a difficulty, then we have to do that. But at the moment, we have been comfortably paying the loans. Maybe not that comfortably, it is a bit of a struggle. But at the same time, with the inflows that we are having, we have been able to do that. And no country can only be using their reserves. You have to look at your cash flows as well. If today you ask one of the top companies, what is your, what is your 
cash in hand and resources at hand. And can you settle all the debts? I don't think they can say that they can. But they will be settling it and as a result of the cash flows that they are going to generate over the years. You as bankers know that. When you give a loan, you can't call on the loan tomorrow. If you call on the loan tomorrow, that guy is going to not be able to pay it. But you know, you are giving him a 10 year period. And that is a term loan. That's how it works. So, we have worked it out in such a way that we now need to ensure that there are new inflows coming into the country which are not debt creating in inflows. That's why we are working on some of those areas. I think we have enumerated those at several times and I have personally explained that as well so I won't go into it in so much detail. But overall, what it means is that we got to take the big picture and see where are our inflows going to come from. How are we going to make those sustainable? Those are the key messages that we must give to our stakeholders and work with them to do that. Today, after this uh, uh, seminar, I'm going for a meeting with the Honorable Finance Minister who has invited the tourist trade. Now we are working with the tourist trade. How can we open up the country as quickly as possible? To open up the country, what are the key steps that we have to take? Yesterday you saw we had vaccinated 515,000 people. Now there is an urgency for that. Not only because we want to ensure that people are well, but also it will mean that we can open the country out fast. So that we can invite tourists. We can have that new stream of, uh, although I am saying new, it's only new at right now. So that we can have that stream of income coming into the country. So that we can deal with the situation as we go along. Now these are all interconnected. That's why you would have seen a sense of urgency in procuring uh, vaccinations, administering the vaccinations. Administering vaccinations is not an easy thing to do. People think, okay, you get so many millions of vaccinations and tomorrow you can get administered. No. You have to get the associated accessories, the syringes, you have to think about the way it is recorded, you have to have a doctor in attendance at every station. So there's a huge amount of work that goes into them. And sometimes when it's delayed by two, three hours, I hear some people complaining. Maybe they are complaining for good reason, but still for all, you would like them to also appreciate that there is a massive program that goes round that exercise. The same way that a massive program goes round the entire exercise of getting novelty back into the country. So, we think that what is ahead of us is to have a sustainable solution. This is a good lesson for us. We can't have higher percentages of ISPs dominating our debt structure. We have to reduce the debt to GDP back again. Reducing the debt to GDP is not only reducing the debt, also increasing the GDP. Both those have to go hand in hand. We are working on both those. So what is ahead of us is that we are working on both those key parameters. We have to keep the interest rates low. That is also ahead of us. If we keep the interest rates low, we can manage the debt easier. The serviceability will be greater. If we can have long-term G2G kinds of debt in, uh, non debt inflows and G2G debt inflows which are perhaps more concessionary that also can be another help in dealing with this situation. So stabilizing the rupee is also vital. This last year we didn't achieve as much as we wanted to but going forward we would like to see that also being on the top list of our priorities, increasing the non debt inflows, making sure that those are driven firmly are important. This last week, I was having meetings with all the different uh, components of those who are responsible for in inflows, the remittances, the exporters of different types of activities, the IT industry. All these are components that we can 
encouraged to do more gentry so in time to come you would find that we would be making a thrust to increase those avenues so that we can go forward with a greater sustainability and a greater clarity i also want to make a request to you that is you must help us to help you this is a two way operation sometimes we find people saying government must do that government must do this government must do the other in sri lanka we have what i call the someone else syndrome everybody is an expert and everyone else knows what the other person should do whenever you see the information that you get is everyone saying this is what the government must do this is what the private sector should do or this is what the doctor should do but it's been told by somebody else not a matter is supposed to do that they told what to do but if you put them in the hot seat many of them will do something different when you are the ceo you will do it different when you are the advisor you will do it different i have been on both i have taken seats on both those i have been a consultant i have been a ceo so i know how you react and you as ceos know what you need to do so get help each other government has to i first say what the government must do the i represent government we have to maintain policy consistency sometimes we are there yes i accept that but we must attempt to maintain policy consistency as much as possible once we have a policy where we say we reduce interest rates or we reduce the taxes we mustn't change it every time we have a tension that's why even in the midst of so many people telling us increase the taxes increase the interest rates we have attempted to stay firm on that path so that we want to give that message to you that we want you to also take those factors into your consideration when you go forward we want to stay keep the rupee stable if we are doing that as much as possible i remember manuel said that i was a young chartered accountant yes i remember at the time that i used to qualify i qualified and we used to do feasibility studies we used to factor in a 10% depreciation of the currency every year today's uh, chartered accountants cannot be doing that but those of who are in my vintage we should do that governor we should do that that was the numbers we used to put we used to have interest rates which are close to 20% what project will be viable at those numbers so government must work to maintain these numbers at reasonable levels so we are committed to that that is the policy consistency that we want to provide to you so we will do that we will want your help to do that but that is the overall stage that we are trying to get at we want exporters to convert their products they get certain advantages i want to ask them again when you get your export proceeds convert those it will help the whole country after all you get certain benefits once you get the benefits you have a responsibility if you don't make use of that in the proper way sometimes we can all get into an unnecessarily difficult situation convert importers also have a role importers must try to import only what is necessary we find that sometimes importers take a call saying thinking that the rupee will depreciate and they want to import next year's inventory as well so then they put all that together so i would like to ask them also in this situation what is ahead of us can be materially different if we all act in a responsible manner those of you who are ceos develop new ideas make your investments we didn't wait saying there is covid situation and then not pass the law for the kalamu port city commission we passed it we made that a priority because we wanted investment to come into this country 
Even during the war, we started on main, major projects. We didn't wait for the war to end. He said, we will start. We have started now. We would like you to come back and take your investment decisions, develop new ideas. We want the funds to come in, particularly to equities once again. Not only foreign in investors, local investors as well. List companies, make that a hub. You will find that the good feeling that is generated will definitely be something that will be of value to everyone. We want investors to use opportunities. We have created new opportunities in this short period of time. The Kalamu Port City, the Hambantota Industrial Zone, the Pharmaceutical Zone, the Education Zone. These are all new ideas which will capture new investment. We want you to come. We have made these invitations abroad as well. The only worry that I'm having is sometimes we can't have meetings other than virtual meetings, so it's a tough call. But those of you who have the opportunity, do that because you will find the greatest value is at the time when there is uncertainty. The world is going through uncertain period. Many of these values are today not as high as it should be. If you had a good run, the values would have been much higher. So you have the opportunity to make use of that. And I would like to ask everyone, look at long term, not just the short term. Covid will be a thing of the past at, at some stage. We all thought that the war won't end, but it ended. It changed. So take a call with some positive features as well. Maybe it may de be delayed here and there, but you know at some stage it has to happen. If you are educating your son to become a doctor, if he gets ill for two weeks, that doesn't mean that you have lost out on that idea of making him a doctor. You still have that. So, in the history of a nation, one year is a short period of time. It may be a difficult year, but the good years will come. But you have to hold on. You have to be holding. I see this as a holding period. When you play a 50 over cricket match, if you lose a few quick wickets, you will hold for some time. You want the number 6 and 7 won't come and hit out as fast as possible. You will consolidate. This is a consolidation period. You will consolidate. There will be a time to hit the 6s. But that time is not yet. But this time is to ensure that we stay on course and we don't lose our wickets. So take good care of your wickets and work on those lines. I want to show you a little picture. Yesterday's VDF is Mr. here? Yeah, yeah. Ah, Mr. I think you did a nice cartoon. I enjoyed it tremendously. <laughs> it said here. They show me in the middle, or inside in the Prime Minister and the Finance Minister, and they say, there's no need to panic. I say the same thing. We are financially very good. But then the Prime Minister is saying, shh, not to make a noise. Perhaps to indicate, well, all is not perfect. I acknowledge that too. I actually enjoy this cartoon and I collect all my cartoons, so I'm very happy that it, uh, I was featured. <laughs> Thank you for that. But also I want to say, the first page of your paper had all the good stories. So it was not me saying it. It was not Nimad Kabla saying that things are perfect. J.K. Tuff's first quarter EBITDA by 496%. The story. NDB posts solid performance. Prime land residencies end on exceptionally high note, CBSL accepts entirety of $58 million. BUI accelerating efforts to attract strategic investments. Basil PAs new measures to boost investments. Stock market manages marginal recovery. Pfizer raises something that's a following story. Every one of those stories were positive stories. 
So it is not only me who is saying it. Sometimes people think that only Kabla is saying these positive stories. <laughs> no. These are all positive stories that are in the same newspaper. So think about that. There are also positive stories, my dear friends. Lots of positive stories. Except that we sometimes don't think of it on those lines. I want to leave you with a message. During war, you have to prepare for peace. We are in a war against COVID now. Prepare for the post-COVID period. That is the important thing. During peace, you prepare for war. So, my message to you is, plan for the post-COVID period, plan for it positively, you will be the one who will reap the benefit. Thank you very much.